What's up? It's Noah Taborda here with Blake Devine for our sixth episode of Blake and Noah, LA to Chicago on a great sports day. How you doing, Blake? Pretty good. Excited to be back. Obviously, a very exciting weekend. NFL, we still got a game going on right now between the San Francisco 49ers and the Seattle Seahawks. So, um, But it's been a really, really good week in all types of sports. Yeah, you know, it's been really exciting, lots of stuff going on, and uh, we're going to start, we started to do this over Skype for the first time ever, and hopefully this goes well, so you know, enjoy the show, and if you have any thoughts, anything to say, anything at all, you can text at 224-563-8444, again, that's 224-563-8444, so yeah, uh, text in, call in, we'll respond to any of your thoughts or comments. Mm -hmm. And with that, we'll move on to our first topic, which is surprisingly a boxing, a topic we don't really cover that much, but um, obviously a really, really big fight last night um, with Floyd Mayweather Jr. uh, masterfully getting a win over Canelo Alvarez. And this was a really controversial uh, fight. It happened last night, and Mayweather was able to win this um, heavy bout. Um, Did you get to watch the fight, Noah? Uh, Yeah, I actually went to Buffalo Wild Wings, and uh, that was probably the highlight. I kind of already thought that Mayweather would win, but the the Wild Wings, the wings were good, so I'm happy. Yeah, we don't really have those in um, California, but I think, I wish we did, and a good way to watch the fight for sure, a 45-0 decision. Yeah, uh, it was, was, um, Mayweather just obviously showed that he was better than Alvarez, obviously for Mexico. This is a big fight, especially with their soccer team struggling so much. So it was very important for them that they could win this fight, you know, give them some confidence as a country. But Floyd Money Mayweather continues going undefeated with only one judge uh, scoring it as a tie. And interestingly enough, the judge, C.J. Ross, was also the one who scored in a win for Timothy Bradley when Timothy Bradley defeated uh, Manny Pacquiao on decision. So he comes up with a lot of controversial things. But I thought that Mayweather obviously showed that he was the better fighter. Uh, props to Canelo Alvarez for you know fighting and he fa- he fought well, but Mayweather was clearly better. Mm-hmm. And this is the highest paid athlete in America right now, Floyd Money Mayweather, who makes I'm not sure what the statistics are, but I know that he is currently the highest paid athlete in the U.S. right now. So with another win, just some more money to go with it. Yeah, and you know it says uh, on ESPN on one of their articles. That Mayweather, uh, he made easy money. He made a guaranteed record purse of forty-one point five million dollars. So that's uh, not, it's not uh, too much. Crazy. It's not like it's what more than LeBron what? makes in two years. Out for one fight. Exactly. LeBron James makes that in two years. Mayweather makes that in one night. So that's pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. And um, with that, we'll move on to our next topic. Um, it was good to cover boxing, though, a topic we don't really talk much about and is not really my forte, but obviously you know a good amount and enough to cover it in our show today. But now we're going to move on to the NBA, um, another Lamar Odom story. This one is breaking news. Um, Lamar Odom charged with a DUI. So how many times is Lamar Odom going to make the news for unbasketball related activities this offseason, Noah? Well, you know, when we were at UCLA and then on in the show, we had to keep talking about A-Rod and all the problems that he was having, you know, with his uh, using the using steroids and all of that. And now it seems like we have another repeat offender, and that would be Lamar Odom. I think, I believe he's been on our show since, like, episode four. So that's three straight episodes with him there. And he's not here for the right reasons, of course. And as I've continuously said... He's got to grow up. I mean, getting charged with D- with a DUI isn't good. He was arrested on August 30th, so I actually believe we covered this in one of our previous episodes that he was arrested for that. And uh, he could face six months in jail and a $1,000 fine. Obviously, that $1,000 fine is nothing to him, but six months in jail is not probably where he wants to be going. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, this guy, I mean, grow up. We're not on Keep It Up with the Kardashians. We want to see you play basketball. That's all we care about. And obviously, all we hear about is the news about his DUIs and his drug problems. It's just not good at all for the sport of basketball or for Lamar Odom. Yeah, I agree. Again, you know, uh, like I say, like one of my favorite things to say, put on your big boy pants. It's uh, it's time to grow up. <laughs> He's uh he acts like a little kid and like I I like your metaphor with uh keeping up with the Kardashians. It's like he thinks he's in his own little world where he can do no wrong, but the truth is that he's on under a very fine microscope, and everything he does is considered wrong right now. Mhm. Um. So that's our Lamar Odom news, and now we'll bring up a new topic, which has to do with both the defending NBA champions, the Miami Heat, and a former. Um, draft pick by them, which is Michael Beasley, who's had his troubles in the NBA, but now he's joining the Miami Heat for kind of a reunion, and they're hoping for a three-peat. Yeah, Michael Beasley was never necessarily the player that they thought he would pan out to be. You know, originally he was supposed to be really good. He came out as his second draft pick behind the infamous Derrick Rose, one of the best picks after the Bulls just somehow managed to snag that first pick despite having such low odds. And he never was what they really needed. He would go on to play with the Timberwolves and the Suns. And he did post some average numbers. But the big problem was hit with him it was his character. So Michael Beasley can give them a good boost and really boost their chances to win a title. But what's very important is that he maintains good character and doesn't end up like Lamar Odom. Mm -hmm. And then personally for you, Noah, do you think bringing him back is a good idea for the team and also Michael Beasley overall? to maybe show his potential star power that we've never really quite seen in the NBA. Star power? I don't think he'll ever be a star. I don't think he can get back up to that level. I think that he can be a good player. I don't think there's any doubt about that. You look at his career stats, 10 points, 4 rebounds, 1.5 assists. You know, that's some solid numbers. There's nothing that's wrong there. You don't say, you don't look at that and say, he's bad. Those are some good numbers. You don't you don't normally have something like that. I think those numbers could potentially go up if he gets playing time, if he you know focuses on his on court performances and not his off court, and if he gets the playing time he deserves. But he'll never reach that level because he's already wasted so much time trying to develop. And even if he ever does, it would be for a short period of time, maybe even a year. But I think it's just very unlikely that he ever reaches that level. But I do think it's a good signing by Miami. Mm -hmm. And do you think that he's going to contribute to the Heat bench this year and uh, maybe bolster them? Um, obviously, they're a very, very good team going for the third consecutive championship, but do you think he can make them better? Oh, yeah, I definitely think he can make them uh, a better team. Um, you know, you look at their team, obviously the big three are phenomenal, but when you add a guy like Michael Beasley, it's another good player coming off the bench. And, you know, they lost Mike Miller, but with bringing in Michael Beasley, you add another one of those players that could possibly be a difference maker in some, in some games. You know, he won't immediately be a player that's going to make you stare and say, wow, they just had the biggest deal of the offseason. But I think he'll still be uh, really good. And just really quickly, uh, I was looking at the Miami page. I just, I didn't even know this, but uh, LeBron James got married. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he got married in San Diego. So now he has three rings. <laughs> Good way to put it, Noah. Uh, next topic, we're going to preview both the Atlantic and the Central Division um, and the Eastern Conference of the National Basketball Association. So uh, we'll with start with the Atlantic. The oh, my gosh, my voice. I'm getting all blurred up here. But the Atlant oh, my gosh, I cannot say it. But let's go with the Central Division first. <laughs> there we uh, go. <laughs> obviously, we have the Chicago Bulls, your favorite team, bringing back Derrick Rose, which is expected to um, bolster them significantly. And then you have the Indiana Pacers, who are coming off of their Eastern Conference Championship um, appearance versus the Miami Heat. You have the Bucks, um, who have lost some key contributors from last year. You have Detroit, who has added some really good players, including Josh Smith, Brandon Jennings, and they have a very good supporting cast. Could be a breakout year for that team. And then Cleveland, who's been pretty good, um, not pretty good, I don't know why I said that. They've been kind of on the lower end of the NBA scale, but they have some very good young talent and are poised also maybe for a breakout year. So, Noah, um, what do you think of this division this year? 
Well, let's start out by eliminating the teams that shouldn't be in the conversation whatsoever. That's Milwaukee. It's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they don't have any real stars anymore. They should just be out of the conversation. Please don't talk about them. They don't deserve to be talked about. You know, they obviously, they didn't handle it right. Had one of the most overrated signings. I mean, signing OJ Mayo for as much as they did, that was just idiotic. So just let's forget about them. Then you go to four teams that could actually potentially make the playoffs. And uh, let's start with uh, my team, the Chicago Bulls. Um, you know, starting at point guard, we all know who's starting. It's not Marquise Teagan. It's not Kirk Heinrich, if that's enough of a clue for you. At uh, shooting guard, you have Jimmy Butler. He's uh, he's a developing player, and he's going to be just get better and better. Really good defender. Small forward. You have Luol Deng, who isn't necessarily the player he once was, but he's still solid. Uh, I'd like to skip over power forward because Carlos Boozer... I don't like him because of his lack of defense. And then at center, you have Joe Kim Noah. And for this Bulls team, the importance is health and that they have other players that step up when it's necessary because Derrick Rose can't do it by himself. They're a team that can beat the Heat, but they don't they need the players to stay healthy and they need players like Jimmy Butler and Lou Aldang to step up when necessary. And mm-hmm. that's what I was saying all the whole time. And stressing all the offseason is that if they don't add another shooter and another scorer, they can't win. Mm-hmm. And then uh, can we just talk about the Pistons here? Obviously, they re-signed Chauncey Billups, which I think is a very interesting move, maybe from a leadership standpoint. Um, they also got Brandon Jennings, who was a superstar over in Milwaukee. Um, they have players like Josh Smith coming over now from the Atlanta Hawks, and he... Is a superstar. He's an all-star caliber player every year, and he's going to make a huge difference for them. And then also, over the draft, they acquired Peyton Siva, who was one of the key contributors on the Louisville uh, 2013 championship team for the NCAA tournament. So some really key players to go along with their current lineup. Yeah, and uh, every year I pick out a couple of games I want to go see of the Bulls, and this is definitely one of the top on my lists. This team went from... A t- from a dud to a stud team. I mean, Brandon Jennings, phenomenal player. Maybe he isn't uh, necessarily what you would say a game changer, but it becomes a game changer when you also add Josh Smith. Josh Smith and obviously Jace Move, a phenomenally play, a uh, phenomenally, a phenomenal player. And you know, now you look at that team, the twin towers of Greg Monroe and Andre Drummond. That'll be a phenomenal rebounding and down low presence. Great defense down low there. Josh Smith, a great athlete, maybe a little undersized, but he'll still be a good contribution as long as he takes smart shots and doesn't take ridiculous jumpers like he was taking on the Hawks, which he shouldn't be considering they do have Brandon Jennings. You have Chauncey Billups, though he is aging, will be good, and it'll be very good for him to be able to teach a young Contavious Caldwell Pope, one of their big draft picks, and he'll learn from Chauncey Billups how to be a much better player. So all around, this team is actually looking like a team that could compete, and I see them, not for a championship, but for possibly a playoff spot, and I do see them making the playoffs as a 7 or 8 seed, and uh, I see them actually being interchangeable as a 7 or 8 seed with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm -hmm. And then now let's talk about those Cleveland Cavaliers, obviously, uh, winning in the draft, the lottery draft, getting the first pick. And then uh, selecting Anthony Bennett, who was a very surprising number one overall pick from UNLV. Um, you add him along with Andrew Bynum, who signed with the Cavs over the offseason. Did not play uh, last year, but was a very good player on the Lakers a few years ago. They also got Earl Clark, a former Laker, who was a key contributor on a disappointing Lakers team last year. And then you put that along players, obviously, like Tyler Zeller, Dion Waiters, and then the superstar, which is Kyrie Irving. So what do you see for this Cleveland Cavaliers team in the 2013-14 season? Well, first of all, if you look on their depth chart currently, they only have 10 players. So first of all, they do have to add a couple more players. They don't really have, I mean, once you add Anthony Bennett, you have another power forward, and then you put in uh, Sergei Karasov, they'll have two more players. But it is looking a little skinny right there. Carrick Felix will be big too. But... They do have a little bit of a lack of depth at this point, but the players that they have because of that lack of depth in one year or two years will make it so they have a lot of depth. But just talking about this year, the addition of Jarrett Jack, 
who was one of the big reasons why Golden State was able to compete with San Antonio, is just gigantic. So Jarrett Jack goes from having Steph Curry as his, as his uh, starter and him being the bench player to having another world-class point guard as his uh, starter as well. So that's it's a lucky uh, it's lucky for him because when he comes in, first of all, his point guard matchup is already worn down. And second of all, he has the skill to, uh, to go for 16 points a game. And he's just a really key backup. Uh, shooting guard Dion Waiters just gonna get better. Like you said, Earl Clark, one of the key contributors to that lake to that uh, lackluster Lakers team, uh, still a good signing. He should be a solid player. Tristan Thompson is just developing, becoming a much better defensive player. And then my favorite signing of the offseason, Andrew Bynum, because even if he doesn't play as they want him to, after this offseason, they can get rid of him. You know, he has his incentives that make the money guaranteed. He has $6 million only guaranteed, and it won't affect the cap for next year for that potential uh, free agency run at LeBron James, that infamous one that LeBron James is currently not thinking of. But, you know, that'll be big for them. So it's just they had a smart offseason, and it really made them a team that can compete for the playoffs. Okay. Um, Let's talk about those Indiana Pacers who were second in the Eastern Conference last year. Really, really high expectations uh, for this season, upcoming season. Um, obviously, with the return of Danny Granger, who was an all-star caliber player before he was injured last season. And then you look at their team, and they have a lot of really good players. And now, kind of a superstar in Paul George, who did a really good job of backing up Danny Granger, and is now the superstar on that team with Danny Granger maybe Um, coming off of a bench role right now, or maybe uh, putting him in at shooting guard or small forward. Not really sure how that's going to work out, but you look at this team and they look really solid. Yeah, they do. Uh, Like you said, you know, Danny Granger is a great player, and he should uh, should continue to contribute, make the team better. But uh, Indiana, you always have to make sure that they play and they stay healthy because if one of their players gets injured... Not Danny Granger, because obviously they've already shown that they can play without Danny Granger. But if Paul George gets injured, their season could be over. If Roy Hibbert gets injured, their season could be over. So it's very important that, just like the Bulls, they stay healthy because they don't have a abscess of star power. Mm-hmm. So um, with all those previews, we didn't really talk about the Milwaukee Bucks, but they're going to be awful, to say the least. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I don't think they're worth talking about. Uh, I don't even know who's on their team except for OJ Mayo. They're just basically a dud team. Let's see. Uh, Luke Ridenauer. Oh, they have Brandon Knight. He's not even starting on their depth chart. Uh, OJ Mayo. Gary Neal is on the Bucks. Okay. So at least they signed somebody who's a decent bench player. Oh, yeah. Karan Butler and Larry Sanders. I forgot about them. Forgot they played in the NBA. Yeah, okay. So, who wins this uh, Central Division and why? Uh, I'm going to go, and this is, if I wasn't biased, I would say it's actually like going to end up being tied in standings and, you know, it'll come down to the tiebreaker. But because I'm slightly biased, just a tiny bit, I'm going to put the Bulls by one game. I what just think they're, I, I think they're slightly better with Derrick Rose. Uh but I think really the teams, the top two teams are almost exactly equal in skill. And then obviously when you go three and four and the Pistons and the Cavaliers, those are both also interchangeable. And how many of these teams make the playoffs? Four. Wow, four teams. Yeah, and the other team... Uh, playoff the other, picture in the East. Yeah, the other team will end up with a high draft pick. Uh, and uh, they will end up being an embarrassment to every, to all of Milwaukee. Me because obviously in that city they have a football team by the name of the Green Bay Packers and nobody will even remember the Bucks play basketball anymore. Mm-hmm. And now let's go over to the Atlantic Division where I could not pronounce the name. That's why we skipped over it, but I worked on my pronunciation. And now we're going to go to the Atlantic. So um, you look at the New York Knicks coming off their title last year in this division. Um, people don't really think this team is going to be as good as they were last year. You look at their team, and they added um, the anonymous meta world piece, um, and then a lot of just not really big-name signings over the offseason, other than um, Andre Bargnani, who um, was a good player in the Raptors, but come on, they're the Raptors. So 
you look at this team, they're very similar from their team last year, which finished second in the overall standings, but um, got knocked off in the divisional round of the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, is it just me, or does this team look like a team of players that is one, overpaid, two, streaky, and three, overly dependent on Carmelo Anthony? Uh, Carmelo Anthony is obviously phenomenal, but Andrea Bargian, uh, Bargnani, oh, that's such a hard name to pronounce, and it's spelled, yeah, so, spelled so funny. Bargnani, there we go. It's spelled B-A-R-G-N-A-N. Oh, no, I can't even, I can't even read it. Uh, but whatever, yeah, he's overpaid. Uh, J.R. Smith, slightly overpaid. Uh, you know, you have Raymond Felton, who's a good point guard, but after that, Pablo Prignoni, not necessarily phenomenal. Neither is Benno Udri. J.R. Smith as the backup on shooting guard is pretty good. You know, that's a good backup shooting guard. Amon Shumpert is developing, and he'll be good. Then you go to the position, small forward, which is obviously dominated by Carmelo Anthony, which makes it so Metal World Peace may actually have to do some time at shooting guard. So that'll be interesting, but no, no, that wouldn't even work because they have uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. there now too. So Metal World Peace could be pushed back a lot. Uh, you go to Power Forward and Amari Stoudemire, I believe, will be coming off the bench with Bargnani starting. So they signed him for so much money from the Suns, and now he's at the bench. Uh, Kenyon Martin, Kmart, will be their third string there. So they do have some depth, actually, though. They do have a good deep team. Except for at center where, besides Tyson Chandler, they have Jeremy Tyler. But I still see this as a playoff team, but I don't see them as the best team. Good point there. Uh, let's now move on to the Brooklyn Nets, the other team um, in New York, who made some really, really big name moves over the offseason, including Kevin Garnett, um, Paul Pierce, and also Jason Terry of all of the Celtics and they, when they made that um, big move. And then they also acquired the rights to Andre Karolinko, who is a very good uh, small forward that is coming from the Utah Jazz. And this is along with a team that already has really superstar quality players like Joe Johnson. And obviously, Brook Lopez is emerging, but I would not call him a star at all. And then you obviously have the best player on the team, which is Darren Williams. And also, to, add, to make matters even more interesting with this team, they're now coached by Jason Kidd, um, the former Nick. Maverick, Net, um, you name it. He's played on a lot of teams, but Jason Kidd coaching this team, um, and it seems like he was just playing basketball a few days ago for the New York Knicks. It'll yeah. be interesting, to say the least. Yeah, this some of the trade they made, like the Celtics trade, reminds me of uh, baseball when the Toronto Blue Jays basically traded for the Miami Marlins. So it's basically it's like the Celtics switch. The Celtics just traded their whole team to the Nets. Obviously, because of that trade, the Celtics are now considered one of the bottom feeders of the league. But the Brooklyn Nets now have pushed themselves much higher up. And like I said before, I didn't see the Knicks as the best team. This is the team I see as the best. At point guard, not much depth there. Sean Livingston, when he he if he had played out like you know how mo so many people expected, would have been a star player. But Darren Williams has that position far and away. At shooting guard, Joe Johnson, the most overpaid player in the NBA. <laughs> I mean, he makes what a hundred. He made a hundred. He was a hundred twenty million for six years, which is not worth it for a player that is not like LeBron quality or Wade, not even Wade quality. So that's not good. Uh, Jason Terry, a good backup shooting guard. Paul Pierce, phenomenal small forward, and as you said, one of the most underrated signings. Uh, signing Andrea Karolinko, just a great signing. Good defender. Uh, power forward, the aging Kevin Garnett. But he's still good, and then you have a lot of hustle there. You know, Kev KG, a big hustle player. Reggie Evans is a hard worker, so that's a big hard working. You know, like you said, the developing Brooke Lopez at center, and signing, and then Andre Blosh backing him up, and Mason Plumley there. That's a good deep team too, and I see them as one of the top teams in the East now, and I also see them as the team that will uh, win this division. Yeah, some people think this team is a dark horse um, NBA Finals champion in the future, possibly. Yeah, I could possibly see that. It's difficult, obviously, a new team, you know, just getting used to each other, and also an old team, but this is professional sports, and you never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll quickly cover the Boston Celtics. Uh, obviously, they lost a lot of really good players, but they hired Brad Stevens, which was a really big move over the offseason, considering all the success he had at a small program like Butler, uh, getting to two straight national title games in the NCAA tournament. And then 
you look at a really good player like Rondo, who is not happy to be on a team that is looking like it's going to have kind of a bust year to get some high draft picks, possibly. Yeah. Um, you know, Celtics, not necessarily a team that you look at and say, ooh, they're really good. They're not the team that people love to see. Rajon Rondo, um, a lot of people think he'll get traded. They do have Avery Bradley, who I think will be a phenomenal player as he gets older. But the rest of that team, Courtney Lee, he's not a good starting shooting guard. Marshawn Brooks, a project for the future. Keith Bogan's old. Jordan Crawford, uh, Jeff Green, not a good starting small forward. Chris Humphreys, he's not even really that tall. He's not really a center. Brandon Bass is not a really great starting power forward. So this team is definitely in rebuilding mode. And for all of those Celtic fans out there, don't expect anything near a playoff berth. Mm -hmm. And then anything to cover with both Philadelphia and Toronto. Um, they both got 34 wins last year, and a lot of people do not think they will be anywhere close to 34 wins yeah. this next year. Yeah, Toronto, they're not worth talking about. They're in the Milwaukee division of teams. They're <laughs> way, way down there. But uh, Philadelphia, they did make some smart moves, in my opinion, by uh, getting Nerlens Noel. Some people thought it was stupid, but I think it's smart that they're going youth and they're trying to go a full rebuild. So I think that's smart by them. But yeah, it will be a long Andrew process. Bynum, then that, that's what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, that, that's my opinion on that one. Yeah, it's really... When you get rid of Andrew Bynum and uh, put all the problems onto another team, you know you did something right. So uh, even though I do like the Andrew Bynum signing, you know, you still got to still gotta be realistic with it. But I, I do like what the, Ni what the Niners... Oh. Niners, Sixers, both number teams. What the 76ers did. Yeah. Well, um, who wins this division when it all comes down to it and why? Uh, Brooklyn Nets. And why? Because they're the Brooklyn Nets and the New York Knicks are the New York Knicks. The Knicks don't, they don't perform necessarily how they should. And the Brooklyn Nets just took the, the, took the moves to get better. I also like their coach more. But yeah. Okay, um, so th that is all of our NBA talk. Um, got to preview the Atlantic and Central Division and the NBA. And now we'll be moving over to Major League Baseball. Um, coming down to the stretch run right here in September. And um, some recent announcements of retirement. Uh, Vlad Guerrero has retired from baseball along with, um, sorry, I lost that note for a second, Todd Helton. So both these players are possible Hall of Fame caliber players that are now announcing their retirement this year. Yeah, uh, Vlad Guerrero I do think is a Hall of Famer. Todd Helton, I don't think he is. I think he's a very good player. And maybe, you know, maybe he could be a, uh, not first ballot by any means, but I think he could be a, uh, I think he could be a Hall of Famer. He was obviously a terrific player, and it's uh, sad to see them go in an offseason where so many greats are going away. In so many sports, obviously, Allen Iverson and T-Mac in basketball. Now Todd Helton and Vladimir Guerrero. But Vladimir Guerrero, uh, past MVP, uh, he hit 318 with 449 homers and 1,496 RBIs. Just a great player. So I think he should be, uh, I think that he should be proud of that career. And both players uh, will be remembered very well. Okay, and then just running by quickly, um, the Major League Baseball standings. Uh, in the East, we have the Boston Red Sox with the best record in Major League Baseball at 91 and 59, uh, leading by nine games over the Tampa Bay Rays. And then in the Central, we have Detroit uh, leading the Cleveland Indians by five games. And then in, in the West, it's still really, really tight. Whoa, it's not really, really tight anymore. I don't know what happened over the weekend, but Oakland now leads the Texas Rangers by six and a half games. I don't know what happened, but uh, I thought a few days ago it was like going back and forth. So I have to catch up on that. But Oakland leading Texas by six and a half games. And then you go to the wild card standings in the American League. And then you have Texas leading. Um, and then you have Tampa Bay really close, or actually tied with them. And then you have the Cleveland Indians only a game, or only a half game behind the Tampa Bay Rays. And then you have New York Yankees. Baltimore Orioles both at two and a half behind. And then in the National League, you have the Atlanta Braves obviously leading the National League East Division by 10 games over the Washington Nationals. And then in the Central, we have Pittsburgh tied with St. Louis currently, both with 87 and 62 marks. And then you have the Cincinnati Reds three and a half behind 
both of those teams. And then in the West, you have the LA Dodgers leading by 10 and a half games over the Arizona Diamondbacks. And then we go to the wild card standings in the National League. And currently leading the National League wild card standings are both the Pittsburgh Pirates and St. Louis Cardinals. who are both battling for that Central Division, and the loser will end up getting the first National League wild card spot. And then in second, you have the Cincinnati Reds. And then Washington is four and a half games behind. So, Noah, quickly looking at these standings, um, what do you have to say about it? Wow, you you got that done pretty fast and pretty efficiently. Not much uh, stumbles there. That's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, Oakland's really opened up that lead, and I think it's really settled down and made us know which teams are winning the division. Oakland's winning the division, Detroit's winning their division, and Boston's winning their division. And we said uh, in past weeks that if Tampa Bay can bounce back, then they can uh, they can get that wild card. But now that Texas and Tampa Bay are slumping, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Cleveland and the Yankees, or Yankees and Baltimore, or Cleveland and Baltimore, or maybe even Kansas City getting a wild card. Kansas City, that is that's scary to think about. Kansas City being in the playoffs. Just Kansas City, who do they have? They have uh Ooh, Eric Hosmer. That's all that's all I know because they they have done nothing in the past. Now I'm actually gonna have to go see who they have. But there's not much to talk about really going on. I think it's starting to uh show itself, see which teams are obviously the dominant teams. I'm surprised the Dodgers haven't gotten back up there. Oh, let's see. Here, here we go. Uh, they have Emilio Bonifacio, Mike Mustakas. Their starting pitchers are James Shields, Irvin Santana, Guthrie, Chen, and Duffy. Okay, so that's not... Uh, Holland is their closer, so they have some players there. But, you know, obviously they're a team that's uh, doing more team rather than just one star. But they, they could make the wild card. That's uh, pretty surprising. Uh, I still think Pittsburgh will take out the division despite going through the slump, and that has been one of the best divisional races, and I think that's the only division worth really paying attention to right now. Mm-hmm. And good points with that, and um, I think we're going to take our first commercial break after quickly going by uh, that MLB, and uh, next up, we're going to be talking about some NFL, a very, very exciting um, day it's so far, and then we'll give you an update on that 49ers Seahawks game, and we'll just talk about all the high scoring affairs. But let's go on our first commercial break right here. Okay, stick around. Your presentation of national sports is brought to you by Spreaker.com. Broadcast and listen to new radio and music with one low monthly rate. Your show will be right back after this word from your local station. You can contact National Sports in a number of ways, through Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, with the label National Sports. We love, love to have to you guys, guys a part of our, of our show, show and can easily join, join us also, also through text or call. You're listening to the National Sports Radio Station on Spreaker.com. What's up? We're back. Uh, short commercial break so we can get a little more talking in rather than make it uh, all music. Uh, this is not a music show, obviously. But um, we're going to get into some NFL. And Blake, what do you have for us to start this uh, NFL segment off? Yeah, we're going to quickly update you on the San Francisco 49ers versus the Seattle Seahawks game, uh, the Sunday night football game of the week. Currently, it is tied at 0-0, and we're in a weather delay in Seattle up there. I know that it's very rainy a lot, and with only 3:13 gone by so far in the first, uh, we're tied at 0-0, so nothing much to really talk about. Quickly running through stats, Colin Kaepernick, 4 for 8 so far with an interception, while Russell Wilson is 0 for 6, uh, not good, uh, with an interception. And then you have Frank Gore with 9 yards rushing on 3 attempts, Colin Kaepernick, 16 yards rushing on only four attempts, and then Marshawn Lynch with 27 yards on three attempts. So not really anything much to talk about other than what I just covered there. So we'll move on to our first topic of the day, which is just running through the scoreboard here. So I'll quickly pull up the scoreboard, and we can then talk about um, what yeah. exciting stuff went down because it was a really, really high-scoring um, game. And then 
I thought the most exciting game today was the Chargers versus the Eagles. This uh-huh. was a pretty – what? <laughs> Uh, biased, biased. It, I thought it was the most exciting game of the season so far because it was thirty-three to thirty, a really high-scoring game, and then it was just back and forth throughout. That's just my opinion. Um, so that was Chargers Eagles, and Rivers and the Chargers uh, were able to stun the Eagles on a last-minute field goal, and then we go down to our next game, which was the Atlanta Falcons defeating the St. Louis Rams at home, and this was uh, led by. Jones is 182 yards, and his touchdown lifted the Falcons past the Rams. And then our next game was the Buffalo Bills were able to beat the Carolina Panthers and move to one-on-one on the season while Carolina fell to 0-2. And the Bills edged the Panthers with a late touchdown um, in that one. And then the other game was the Chicago Bears defeated um, the Minnesota Vikings 31-30 in a very exciting battle. And they barely edged them out on uh, Jay Cutler's touchdown pass to Bennett. So this was a really exciting game. While the Bears went 2-0 on the year, while the Vikings fell to 0-2. The other game uh, was Noah's Green Bay Packers defeating the Washington Redskins 38-20 hey, oh. at Lambo Field. Yeah? Yeah, it's a big win for yes, us. No? It's a big win. <laughs> Happy about that. Getting our first yeah, win on the season. Great, great numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was obviously a fun game to watch, and Redskins, they're not showing their uh, their ability to play. Obviously, your Eagles blew them up last week, and now my Packers blow them up this week. So something's not going right there in Washington. They probably want to figure that out. But obviously, Michael Vick uh, had a field day against them. Aaron Rodgers had a field day. LaShawn McCoy had a field day. And for the first time in 45 games, the Packers had a 100-yard rusher in James Starks. So I'm happy about that. The longest streak in the NFL has been broken. Thank you, James Starks. Mm, really? And Eddie Lacy uh, got knocked out of that game with a concussion early in the game. Yeah, who needs Eddie Lacy when you have James Starks who can run for 130, 136 yards, I believe. It yeah. was just a great game. Second, second best uh, fantasy running back, and he was terrific this week. So that was uh, it was a nice sight. Fun to see. Hmm. And then another game to talk about was the Miami Dolphins um, beat the Indianapolis Colts in Indy to go to 2-0 on the year while the Colts fell to one-on-one. This was a 24-20 victory, and uh, despite the Colts rallying in the late seconds, um, the Dolphins were able to pull out the victory. And um, another game to talk about was the Kansas City Chiefs uh, going to 2-0 on the year with a victory 17-16 17-16 to 16 over the Dallas Cowboys, and uh, nobody really expected this from this Kansas City Chiefs team. I don't think under Andy Reid, who was fired from Philadelphia last season, but 2-0 already on the year. Um, another game to talk about, the Baltimore Ravens, the defending Super Bowl champions, defeated the Cleveland Browns 14-6 uh, while improving to 1-1 and on the year while the Browns fell to 0-2. The Texans were able to defeat those Tennessee Titans in overtime in a wild rally that saw those Texans pull out the victory 30-24. to Another game to talk about, the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, St. Louis Cardinals, well, we're not talking about baseball. The Arizona Cardinals were able to beat the Detroit Lions 25-21 to in um, Bruce Aries' first um, home game. So one of his home debut. Another game, the Saints uh, defeated the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 16-14, to which saw the Saints improve to 2-0 on the year while the Buccaneers fell to 0-2. And this was uh, by the Saints' late field goal um, in a rainy game in Tampa Bay. Another game to cover, the Oakland Raiders defeated the Jacksonville Jaguars 19-9 in a field goal heavy game where Darren McFadden also rushed for a few he rushed for 129 yards but didn't have any touchdowns while the Raiders improved to 1-1 while Jacksonville fell to 0-2. Another game, the Manning Bowl. Peyton Manning was able to edge out Eli Manning and the uh, New York Giants 41-23. to And this saw the Broncos improve to 2-0 on the year while the New York Giants fell to 0-2. And Peyton's Broncos got the best of Eli and the Giants. And then our Thursday game, a lot earlier this week, uh saw a really defensive battle between the New England Patriots and the New York Jets. And this was a 13-10 game. 
It was really, really sloppy, had a few brawls in it, and just some some very defensive football. We saw Tom Brady only throw for 185 yards and saw Geno Smith throw for a few interceptions, not touchdowns, interceptions. So, Noah, um, after now I've just ran through the whole scoreboard. So, what have you taken away from this week two so far? Obviously not done. We still have Monday Night Football tomorrow, and we still have that Seahawks uh, 49ers game, uh, which is currently going on right now. Yeah, you know, okay, just first of all, it's uh, been a really good job by you. That's two for your two for two on really fast rundowns of standings and scores, so that's solid. But uh, this was one of the most exciting weeks I've seen in a while. Let's just, when you ran down it, uh, Rams-Falcons was a seven-point game, so that's a touchdown difference. Bills-Panthers, one-point game on a last-second touchdown by EJ Manuel. Bears-Vikings, Martellus Bennett gets that touchdown. It's a one-point game. Uh, okay, Packers-Redskins, that's not a close game. Uh, Dolphins-Colts, uh, four-point game. That's another one-possession game. Chiefs-Cowboys, a one-point game. Chargers-Eagles, a three-point game. Browns-Ravens, that's an eight-point game, but that's still a touchdown and a two-point conversion. Titans and Texans, an overtime game. Saints-Buccaneers, two-point difference. And Cardinals-Lions, a four-point difference. Then you go to the Raiders-Jaguars. That's the only other game that wasn't really that close of a game because of the defensive ability of the Raiders. The Jaguars, interestingly enough, were the last team to get a touchdown before Chad Henney threw for one in the uh, fourth quarter. But they did get their touchdown, luckily. But they have had just a terrible start to the year, only getting two points. Uh, and then the only game that was the only game besides the Packers game that was really like a big blowout was the Broncos over the Giants. So this was just a very good week of football. All very close games. Lots of heartbreakers for your uh, for your Eagles. Heartbreakers for all of those teams that were so close to winning. But the team I'd most like to really address is the Chicago Bears because they're 2-0, and but they are a lucky 2-0. and They barely made it out of this one on a last-second touchdown. And against Cincinnati, they lost, They won a game that they probably should have lost. So, like, what do you really think about this Bears team that's barely making it out of these games? Yeah, I think um, it's good that they're 2-0. and That shows a lot of teams don't make it out of that second week 2-0 and in the NFL. You see... It's a very, very tough regular season, but 2-0 and with two very close victories. But um, you see Jay Cutler, and I thought that he played really well this um, this week versus Minnesota in a divisional game. It was obviously very important. Um, trying to pull up his statistics on the week uh, quickly for you. Uh, losing it. Okay, uh, Jay Cutler, 20 for 39, 290 yards and three touchdowns. Really, really good numbers. And then... Um, Matt Forte had 19 carries for 90 yards, um, so he did really good. And this was their second home victory, so you look at their schedule right now, and this Bears team is going to play their next game at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a Sunday night football game, so I think this one, this next test could be the real showing if this team is for real, playing against a Pittsburgh team that ends in as good as it's been the past few years, but... Um, I think it'll be a test for them, uh, night game in Pittsburgh. Yeah, another one of my top performers. Uh, I just like to talk about the Packers because, just like I said before, your Eagles destroyed them week one. So this is a best and worst team, kind of. The Packers, one of the best teams in the week. Obviously, James Starks, 132 yards rushing, one touchdown. James Jones going for 178 yards receiving. Aaron Rodgers threw for 330 yards in the first half alone. Finished with 480 yards and four touchdowns. Definitely asserting himself back to the MVP conversation. And you go to the other side. RG3 did throw three touchdowns, but it came in that se- all came in the second half when they were already well out of the reach of getting a win. So not important. Too little, too late. And I, what do you, what do you think about this Redskins team? Another one of those teams that just doesn't seem to be winning the games that they should be winning. Not counting yeah, this game. I really, I really thought that they were going to win that first Monday Night Football game against my Eagles, but I was, um, I was really surprised, but also really happy that they were able to lose to the Eagles. But um, speaking unbiasedly here, I do think that this Redskins team does not look good at all, to say the least. Um, giving up lots of points um, to both the Packers and the Eagles, and 
You look at their schedule, and they get to play Detroit at home. I think this could be a redemption game for them and kind of maybe spur them to turn it around because they play Oakland the next week, and then they get a bye. So their schedule is pretty favorable to get it turned around, but I think they really got to win next week to um, revamp their season, or it could be off to a disastrous start for this team. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let me look at an 0-2 team here, the, uh, the Browns. The Browns obviously struggle. This is uh let's actually let's talk about both teams in this matchup. The Browns struggle against the Dolphins, and then they had the lead against the Ravens for most of the game before letting up two straight touchdowns. So what do you uh what do you think about this? Uh do you think Trent Richardson will rebound after only going for sixty yards, or do you think that the Browns will continue to play at the same level? Um the Browns come on with Let's talk for real here. I do not think the Browns are in for any improvement. If the Browns are playing bad, they are going to play bad the whole season. Um, I usually think that if teams that are traditionally pretty bad play bad in the first uh, few games of the year, that they're in for a pretty darn bad season. So I don't know why I'm saying bad so much, but the Browns are just not a good team, and I do not expect them to have any uh, turning around this year. So I think it could be maybe a 2-14, and 3-13 and 13 kind of a year for this for this team. Okay, and uh, really quickly before we uh, go on to our next thing, just to address the uh, Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are the defending Super Bowl champions, but they obviously they got pummeled by the Broncos and now they struggle against the Browns. Uh, what's wrong with the Ravens? Is it something with the personnel, coaching? What What do you think it is? I don't think anything's wrong with this team with personnel and coaching. I think it has to do with them losing key contributors from last year and key leaders like Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, um, other numerous players left their team, and they obviously got Elvis Dumerville, but just a lot of new faces and new places for this team, and nobody's really been comfortable stepping up in leadership other than maybe Joe Flacco, and I think this team is really experiencing some uh, differences in personnel on play uh, for player-wise uh, reasons. So I think they're still struggling to find their identity. Yeah, good points there. So what do we have next? Um, just top performers from the day um, and early maybe award candidates. Okay, so my. Uh... My week two MVP is Aaron Rodgers. Not even biased about that. 480 yards and four touchdowns. And now if you have to look at MVP overall, I'm going to give it to Aaron Rodgers. Again, this one is a squeaker, and that part is just a tiny bit biased. That's what got him over the hump. I really think they're almost exactly equal. Aaron Rodgers playing for about 40 more yards. And they both him and Peyton Manning have been phenomenal. But Aaron Rodgers showed a little more consistency than Peyton Manning going for two straight good weeks, whereas Peyton Manning did not quite have the same level as he had the first game. So I think that almost hurt him that he had such a good performance. And then on the defensive side of the ball, uh, actually, let's go to the rookie right now, rookie of the year award. And now you got to go with EJ Manuel. He had just such a great day. Uh, he led them to a win on that last second touchdown. So he's definitely got to be one of the big team, one of the big players right now. And uh, now we can go to defensive player. Uh, this week, I've got to say that my number one, I mean, just on a defensive, like just straight up defensively, uh, I'd have to say Aqib Talib was really, really good, as well as Luke Kukuli. So those are my defensive players of the year uh, and based on the first two weeks. Okay, good points there, Noah. And with that, we're going to wrap up um, the NFL for this week and move over to college football where we had a really exciting uh, Saturday slate and some good games all around. Um, the most talked about and hyped game over the preseason was this battle between Johnny Manziel and Texas A&M versus the defending two-time national champion, um, the Alabama Crimson Tide, and this game was as good as advertised, to say the least. Um, Alabama ended up giving 628 yards to Johnny Manziel's Texas A&M team, while the Alabama offense was able to pull through, and they ended up uh, pulling out the victory in College Station 49-42 to in what was 
um, one of the best games that I've seen in the past few years in college football. I mean, it was just back and forth throughout, um, just really, really high caliber offense, the kind of offense that you like to see in college football and that you don't maybe see much in the NFL, but it was just a shootout throughout the game. Johnny Manziel might have had his uh, uh, signature highest moment for this year on that one play where he was almost sacked um, for it would have been probably about a 15 yard loss um, I thought and then he was able to break loose and throw a ball just from his um, I think he was making a hop step and just threw it and one of his wide receivers made an almost David Tyree like catch so he had a really really good play I wish I could uh, show you it but we're obviously talking radio so I have to explain it and um, AJ McCarron in the tie though they were able to pull through and in a game that some thought were um, was going to be Alabama's toughest test this year in the regular season. Yeah, it was a really good game. And for a point there, it really looked like Alabama was going to pull away, that it was over. But the Aggies obviously showed a lot of resolve with that great fourth quarter outscoring them 21-7. They just couldn't pull it out. But Texas A&M still showed that they're a good team. And they managed to exploit some of Alabama's weaknesses, but Alabama just showed that they are still the best team in the nation and still the favorite for the national championship. But I was I was impressed by Texas A&M, but I do think that this is it's over for their national championship hopes after this loss. I do think they're still in it for a BCS bowl, but it's over for their national championships. Okay, and with that said, um, do you think Alabama will cruise through the rest of their schedule and head straight up to that SEC title game? Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I do. You know, you look at their schedule. It's not e. It's not what you say easy. You have Ole Miss in uh, two weeks, which should be a difficult game, and LSU another challenge. But I do think that all of those games are easily doable. And I think this is uh this is another time that they'll be heading to the national championship because they uh they make it through the games that they need to. And when you look at Texas A and M, uh, you also have Ole Miss and LSU. So I think. It could be easy for Texas A&M also to cruise to a BCS Bowl. Okay, uh, yeah. Just speaking on the other hand, with Texas A&M, you look at their schedule, and it is a lot more challenging than, than the rest of Alabama's schedule. They have to play at Old Miss in a few weeks, and then right at the end of the year, they play at LSU and at Missouri con- in consecutive weeks to end the regular season. So, um, where do you see this team finishing overall, like record-wise? Um, I don't know. I'd say. Obviously, uh, probably, I'd say, with one loss. I think it'll be a one-loss season. A co- you, mean, you mean just the loss to Alabama? You think they'll go undefeated yeah. throughout the rest of the year? Yeah, I think it'll be close against LSU. Uh, I think they'll handle Ole Miss as they should, but I do think they'll go undefeated for the rest of the year and better their record by one game from last year. Wow, and this is uh, despite all the off-season trauma that was talked about Johnny Manziel. You think they'll do even better yeah, as you- a team? You know, you don't you don't play well against Alabama, and then uh, just uh, actually no, that's not true. Let me not say, and then you just go on and uh, suck for the rest of the year. That can possibly happen, uh, but I don't think the trauma and all of the off season hubbub really affected them as badly as I thought it would. I think they've shown that they're still a good team, and I think that Johnny Manziel is prime for another Heisman candidate season. Mhm. Okay, well, let's just run down um, some scores. Um, Oregon destroyed Tennessee as Marcus Mariota threw for 456 yards as the Oregon Ducks defeated the Tennessee Bulls 59-14. to um, And then your Ohio State Buckeyes were able to cruise to a victory over Cal in Berkeley in a game without Braxton Miller and on the road in a tough environment, but they were able to pull away with that one with some ease and a game that some people thought could be an upset alert but uh wasn't to be at all yeah it wasn't uh great game great performance they obviously showed they're a much better team and i i think it was uh not really super surprising that they won but you know you never know Mm -hmm. okay just talking uh big 10 uh while we're on the topic michigan barely survived almost an Appalachian State kind of game versus Akron, who is only 1-2 and two on the year. Um, they don't even play, I don't think they play in uh, Division One. No, they don't. So they're a MAC team uh, for college football, and they almost beat Michigan on the road at the Big House 
uh, a week after Michigan had gotten a really big victory over Notre Dame, and it, Michigan was barely able to survive a scare from this lowly Akron team. Yeah, uh, obviously I hate Michigan because I'm an Ohio State fan, and I was so upset. Two times in the final seconds, Michigan was able to stop Akron on the goal line, so they got lucky, but it definitely looks like Michigan is, subs- is susceptible to a loss. And it was just last week we were talking about how Michigan could possibly go undefeated up until, up until that Ohio State game, but now I'm going to cut that short two games, and I'm going to say they're going to they're gonna go undefeated up until... Actually, I'll cut it short three games. They're going to go up and teated, up, uh, ugh, ugh, undefeated up until Nebraska, and then they're going to lose. And then they're going to lose to Northwestern, win against Iowa, and lose against Ohio State. So from a potential one-loss season, this game just made me think that it'll go to a potential three-loss season. Okay. Um, and then another really notable game to talk about was UCLA was able to rally from 18 points down to shock Nebraska and the Cornhuskers at a game in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, so UCLA, 16th ranked, defeated the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Everyone's just babbling their words tonight, Noah. Um, 41 to 21 in a really exciting game that saw Brett Huntley, Brett Hundley throw for 294 yards um, and three touchdowns. Yeah. The Big Ten really struggled today. All right, today. Okay. Now, yesterday. Today is Sunday. Yesterday was Saturday. Okay. Nebraska lost. Illinois lost to Washington. Shout out to Ian Martin's favorite college. Really playing well. They should be moving up in the rankings. 19th ranked right now. Arizona got upset by Arizona State. Purdue got beat by Notre Dame by one touchdown after getting absolutely destroyed in the fourth quarter. So nothing going right for them. Northwestern struggled at the beginning against Western Michigan, but then obviously routed, rerouted their path in the right direction. It's just been a tough day. I mean, it's been a tough day for the Big Ten, and they're not showing what they're made out of UCLA with a big statement win. Okay, well, that was our scoreboard rundown. And quickly, uh, Noah, Heisman, um, top three Heisman candidates after uh, week three in college football. Okay, well... This week did not do much to separate it, but for the first time, Johnny Manziel is going to pop back into the rankings. I'm going to go through my three top ones, and then I'll rank them. Uh, my my one, I already just said Johnny Manziel, uh, and my other two. Jameez Winston was what played well, but he did not do well enough to earn a spot in my Heisman rundown. My other two are Taj Boyd and Teddy Bridgewater. In third place, I have Taj Boyd. Very good quarterback, but uh, I'm going to have to say that Teddy Bridgewater is just slightly better than him, as is Johnny Menzel. And in second place, I really don't want to do this, but I'm going to put Teddy Bridgewater, and I'm going to say that Johnny Menzel will repeat his Heisman and become the second player ever besides Archie Griffin to win two Heismans. Archie Griffin obviously coming from Ohio State, so that's nice, but he will win the Heisman based on just the first three weeks. Obviously, things can change, but he is my early pick at this moment. Well, bold statement for um, for you, Noah. After Johnny Manziel lost to his biggest rival, which was Alabama, in a game that really, I mean, he performed really well, but his team lost. But bold statement for the to say the least. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a close. It's a close call, but um, I really just have to say that he is the best player. Yes, they did lose. But yes, they did. Uh, he did have a great, great season. Um, it's not easy to really go out and perform that well against Alabama. Obviously, throwing for over 400 yards, one of his best games actually of his career. So I was relatively impressed, and I think that uh, I think he has to be the favorite now after having such a great, such a great week. Yeah. Good points there, Noah. Um, and now we're going to wrap up our college football and wrap up our show as well. We're 108 minutes in, so we've had quite a good show. A lot of topics to talk about, so we had to cover the majority of them. Um, so we're going to go straight to our um, our final closing countdown, which is our birthdays of the day. So, Noah, uh, what do you got for us? Uh, always fun to acknowledge the birthdays. Let me just pull up these birthdays real quick. Here we go. Uh, so let's, uh, let's see. 
Uh, Mike Dunleavy Jr., one of the recent signings by the Bulls, uh, he turns, let's calculate, this is 33. I, I know math, that's good. He's going to be 33. Jason Terry's birthday today as well. He's going to be 36. We just talked about him earlier on in this show. In football, Marshall Yonda is his birthday today, as well as Dan Marino. Dan Marino, I think that's the biggest name we've had on one of our shows so far. Great quarterback. So that's a uh, happy birthday to him. Joel Quenville, the head coach of the defending champions, Chicago Blackhawks, one of my favorite teams. So that's big. Patrick Marlowe, another really good player in the NHL. It's his birthday today. Johan Niskins, a great Dutch player's birthday. And that, that about wraps it up. Yeah, okay. Well, good job there, Noah, with the birthdays. And um, now it's time for some shout-outs. So, uh, personally, I would like to shout-out to our U.S. Uh, men's national soccer team who qualified for the World Cup the other day with their um, with their 2-0 victory over Mexico in a World Cup qualifying game played in Ohio. Um, and this was a really, really good game um, because we beat our arch-rival Mexico and also qualified for the World Cup as well as maybe damaging Mexico's chances of making the World Cup. So... Shout out to the men's national team for soccer. Yeah, Mexico struggling in a lot, especially with the Canelo Alvarez loss, as I told you earlier on. And uh, yeah, uh, shout out to all my family. Shout out to Ohio State getting that third win. Let's go, O-H-I-O. We're going to run the table, going to the national championship, hopefully. Shout out to the Packers picking up their first week and absolutely dominant. Picking up their first week. Picking up their first game, their first win in an absolutely dominating performance against the Redskins. And uh, shout out to, let's see, who else? Shout out to the Chicago Bulls. Hopefully they can pull it together as we start getting into the season. And of course, uh, tune in for uh, Football Weekly, my soccer show, talking about the teams that qualified for the World Cup again. Much quicker on that, but we'll be able to talk about uh, some club soccer after what was a very busy week in national soccer last week. So yeah, I uh, Tune in for that. Yeah, and I'm Blake Devine signing out. And take care, everyone. Have a good week. Yeah, see you guys later.